My name is Aaron Gearhart. I'm the gallery director here at the Alliance for the Arts. And I just want to send a huge thanks out to Kinfei Maroti for this, uh, putting together this amazing exhibit. Um, it's entitled Inseparable, which we'll get into the details and complexity of that uh, later with Kinfei. Um, but I also um, wanna mention, talk about this exhibit. It's sort of, um, it's, it's a, it's a pop-up exhibit, which means it sort of popped up, but uh, it, it did come together very nicely. It was sort of um, talking with Kim Bay, we, we worked together putting this, uh, it was an honor to sort of work with, alongside him with, with uh, create, putting up and installing his vision here. Um, but it was put together in conjunction with the annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Weekend, uh, hosted by the Dunbar Festival Committee. So, um, it is on display. Uh, you can come see it in person until January 29th. That's next Friday. Uh, so please do come by. We're open on Saturdays, nine to one and throughout the week, um, uh, nine to five. So come on by, take a look, see the work in person. It's a beautiful exhibit uh, to walk through it and be in this space uh, is a really, truly amazing experience. And now tonight you'll get the behind the scenes uh, detailed complexity. Uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, Kim Fei, uh, he's a documentary visual journalist. He was very uh, uh, adamant to not title himself as a visual artist, but uh, I think he's working on that title here, whether he knows it or not. But I think it's a good context for him uh, and as far as for his perspective as well, to see where he's coming from at this gives a, a, a richer background and experience to, to who he is and how he sees the world and how he's used to documenting imagery and experiences and emotions and, and all this, how it ties together with the, his, his mode of thought. Um, he's a partner at the Southwest Florida Community Foundation and also creator of Hopeful Images, which uh, helps nonprofit and community organizations tell their stories through imagery. And um, he's uh, been a photojournalist for the News Press 2004 to 2019, um, covered the Iraq War in 2003. And um, what's amazing about, uh, you know, he speaks about his work, it, 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 he captures, tried to capture his life, life's beautiful struggles. Um, and I think that uh, speaks volumes here um, with all of us. And it's, it's really something nice to experience, uh, to see that duality. Um, like I mentioned, I got to work with Kim Bay on putting this together. We, he, it was, um, it, it was a wonderful experience because, getting to know him and work alongside him, the questions that he asked, the reflection and examination that we sort of went through together with this exhibit. I, I was really honored to be part of that. And I thank you again, I can't thank you enough. Um, and it was it was really a powerful experience. And, and then to be able to let people walk through the exhibit on their own. So, so Kinfei's working, he's treading this line between and I'll let you get more into this, but I, just a, as a window or opener about, it, it seems, you know, we talked a little bit about it, trading this line about interpretation and what viewers bring to the work. So, I mean, from, from me coming from a, a arts background, um, you know, looking how we look at work, how we break down work, uh, or not break it down, but dissect the elements of the visual components of it. Um, Kimbe's got an interesting take on and just a, a, an embrace with the interaction between objects. So um, it, it was a, a pleasure to to go through that process with you, and, and thank you again, um, Kimbe. I'll I'll, I'll uh, hand it over to you. We're gonna go. Do, you're gonna give us a little walk through. I'm gonna jump over into the gallery here, and then be your camera uh, cameraman, and um, I'll I'll be masked up. I'll come on over there. I'll be behind the camera. I'll let you say a few words, and then once I make my way over there, we'll we'll dive in. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you guys for taking time out of your day, um, you know, working long hours and um, sharing some of that uh, intimate time, you know, with us here at the Alliance with the Arts. Uh, as Aaron alluded to, um, you know, we got together maybe about three weeks ago and uh, we sat down and, and shared some ideas about maybe what we can make a run at together. You know, I think what would satisfy me as a storyteller and, and reflect my uh, relationship with the community here in Southwest Florida, but then also what can really fit the home here at the Alliance for the Arts. Because I think uh, you can have a space and no art, or you can have an art and no space. And so I think that 
there has to be a real good collaboration uh, in order to, to make something really um, special and meaningful. And so with that said, you know, let, let's talk about like the idea. Let's talk about uh, the exhibit. Uh, you know, when we initially talked, we had a lot of ideas and some ideas didn't kind of like resonate with me personally, maybe because the way I live my life, it's, it's pretty uh, like filter free, you might say. I try not to hold on to too many labels. Uh, just try to beat Ken Fay. And so uh, the idea that um, I thought about after our initial talks was this uh, inseparableness that we have with one another throughout the human condition. Like we are going to be together on this planet, whether we like it or not, you know, like we're inseparable in that way. And we're going to share our life's moments with the other people on this planet. Now for this particular show, you know, um, you know, we're looking at the, the inseparable union that black and white people have together. And, um, and, and to me, that is a union that takes place every single day through shared life's moments, whether it be birth, whether it be in our time, whether it be in our violence, whether it be in death, whether it be in caring for one another, black and white people find themselves together. And like nine times out of 10, it's an okay interaction. It's not a uh, overly negative interaction. There, there's curiosity both ways. But then also, um, as I was thinking about this inseparable union of black people and white people together, I decided to maybe get a little shallow, you know, and, and like annoy people with this idea that we are in love with the black and white aesthetic. Our tuxedos are black and white. Our clocks that we use are black and white. The Bibles or the Qurans or the Baba Gita's that we read are written in black and white. The stories of our creation, how we came to be about, were written in black and white. Now we don't say, oh no, I'm not gonna read the Bible because it's in black and white, I'm not gonna read it. If it was in red and green, I'll read it. That, that, that's crazy. We embrace the aesthetic of black and white like, like no one else. And so what I really tried to do was look inside of myself and recall the moments that I captured from the Southwest Florida community where black and white people are forming this union. And then accent or accentuate the moments with everyday black and white items that kind of speak to the moments, but also show as an extra hit over the head for me and for everybody else that we are okay with the aesthetic of black and white and we are really okay with being together as black people and white people. And so um, there's not one ounce of color in this exhibit, maybe except for uh, my skin or Aaron's skin, right? And that is absolutely on purpose because when it's done, I wanted everyone to leave just last thing they want to see is black and white. <laughs> so then maybe when they get out into the world, they'll just see Aaron or they'll just see, you know, Thomas or whoever. And so, um, I don't know. Uh, I think I cut my vein on this one. And, uh, you know, I, I um, I'm still searching myself to try to figure out um, exactly um, what the stories mean to me. It's not a, uh, a through process, you know? And here's one big thing that's super important. So Aaron and I, we're gonna guide you guys through this exhibit and I'm gonna stand in front of each picture and I'm gonna run off at the mouth, my thoughts about this. And I'm fine doing that, no problem. However, do not make my thoughts your thoughts because you may see something that I did not intend to say. And that's perfect. My vision is not the vision. It's just my thoughts 
in this particular situation. So we're going to try to give you guys a great look at it, but you can always come down through January 29th and see it and spend some time with the moments. And um, I think maybe enough talking to my end. Are you ready to get going, Aaron? Oh, there'll be more talking there. But okay. Great, great <laughs> intro. All right, all right. Great window into. I'm going to flip the camera around here. Okay. And let me make a little adjustment. All right. While he's making that adjustment, I believe you guys can still hear me. I'm just going to go ahead and begin um, at the beginning of the exhibit and share my thoughts about it. And uh, I'm gonna act as though you are actually in the room here with me. I can get quite animated. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to um, be patient if I start to ramble at all. I'll, ra I'll wrangle you back. Okay, here. you can do that. Right. <laughs> right. All right, so we're starting here on the left. I'll get a little closer to this image. Yeah, and so um, our union I feel begins as early as birth. And in this particular moment, it's a Lee Hell's nerd and she's carrying a, a young black baby boy. And I captured this moment while uh, doing a project for Lee Health. And, and in many ways, this is the genesis of black and white people being together. It, it begins at birth. And so, you know, maybe kind of cleverly, I poured a book, a page from the book of Genesis that has the story of the creation. And, and I think this kind of reiterates my point that the stories about our creation, about how our union begins is written in black and white. Our faith, our faith is, is shared to us with these colors. The story about our creation um, is really, um, in black and white, and we accept it. So I thought that was a kind of uh, maybe cool, kind of clever way to try to show that this union begins like at, at the very earliest stages of life, you might say. Now, when you go from birth, our youth, our kids, my 13 year old daughter and, and your children, they have no problem with that union the dancing classrooms at Miramar outlets, different schools come and they dance together. They learn to ballroom dance and the music of their life begins to expand. You know, their life begins to expand. Their life begins to find a rhythm. But look, that young man doesn't care what color she is. He doesn't, he's having an amazing time. And at that stage in our life, all that matters is that they are doing something that they love to do. But see, the thing is, they're dancing to music. Oh, Kim Faye, it's just not that shallow. So I said, okay, you know what? Our music is in black and white. Chopin is in black and white. John Lennon wrote, let it be in black and white. Or one of our most popular musicals we have now, Alexander Hamilton is in black and white. We don't say we're not gonna play Hamilton because it's in black and white. And we don't say we're not gonna let them dance at the dancing classrooms because they're black and white. So I thought that maybe if I begin to show how the rhythm of our life begins, it'll be a good way to go ahead and transition to out of this youthful stage to something that I think is really, really cool, something that I really, really like a lot, you know, which is um, our friendships. The friendships that we have are part of our life. We, we enjoy seeing them. Tatum Hayes, Fort Myers High School basketball player, one of her best friends came out to the regional championship game and he was there for her. Our friendships that we have are fine. We don't have a problem being friends. And this is kind of a fun little piece right here. So I was at Big Lots and I found this, uh, this little plaque that you hang up. And um, it says, eat like Joey, dress like Rachel, cook like Monica, live like Phoebe, care like Ross, laugh like Chandler. I had no idea what that was, but. I thought maybe it was alluding to a show called Friends, and sure enough, it was. 
And so I thought that that would be kind of cool for someone to come and they would kind of stay engaged with this moment a little bit longer because they're trying to figure this out. This is pop culture. One of our most popular TV shows for the last 30 years markets itself in black and white. Now, when you see the actual Friends logo, they have little small color dots between each letter. But aside from that, they push out their story and they push it out in black and white. So pop culture is fine with it, you see? And we can be friends, you see? So our union begins in birth, it goes through our youth, and then it goes into our teen years and, and, and we start to form friendships with one another. Now, as we are together in all of those beginning aspects, we are even inseparable in our violence. 1930 in Indiana, these two young black men were hung from a tree. That union of white and black resulted into this hanging. 70, 80 years later, 2018, a very, very brutal interaction between a white police officer and Ashley Talley at a hip hop concert. When I captured that moment, it was as though this was repeating itself. So thoughts that I have when I decided to put these two pictures together is, is this the modern day version of that? is the acceptance of the treatment of black people by some white people continuing and endorsed. Well, some might say yes, because 70 or 80 years later, we're having incidents like this repeat themselves. Uh, so, so what does the white hanger mean? I don't know, am I taking a jab at my white brothers and sisters that act that way? I don't know, maybe. Does it, is it a subtle reference to the hoods of the Ku Klux Klan? Maybe so. Oh, well, what's this rope all about? It's black, it's white, and you got some gray. When I saw that, I knew I had to find that. Yeah, it's an allusion maybe to the ropes there. But also, it's like three sides to a story, even a horrific story. And thus, that's what that gray symbolizes, because these people will say they did something very bad to their loved ones. And then their family will say, no, they didn't, thus this gray area. Same thing plays out here. I don't know. This one just felt good together, when I mean good together, as a story. Um, it's a lot there to unpack. However, in allusion to that Hamilton uh, soundtrack that I used, I decided to take songs from that soundtrack and continue that rhythm of life together because the music that we play, we share with one another in good times and even in bad times. Bob Dylan, Blowing in the Wind, a song written by a white man for the civil rights movement in a very harsh time. Now this particular song from Hamilton is history has its eyes on you. And I think it's fitting to kind of be in this kind of uh, area here. But what's really cool is that we are inseparable in our violence and we are also inseparable in our efforts to make peace with one another. So just as there are these tense and often brutal and fatal interactions between police officers and African-Americans or minorities as of late, there are also these peaceful efforts that both sides make. And so, you know, when I captured this moment at a unity rally, at Clemente Park in Dunbar, it's one of my most favorite moments 
that I've ever captured. It's not the best one. It's not the most emotional one, but it's one of the more truer ones because these guys are really trying to iron some stuff out. <laughs> you know, I wanted to say the SH word, but I don't know if Aaron will be upset, but they're trying to iron some ish out here, you know, and yeah, this is for the younger generation. They don't know what this is. This is a black and white ironing board. And so when I saw that at the Salvation Army, I just threw my hands up like, yes, that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go ahead and put that moment there. And I think that uh, most people will uh, figure out that they're trying to get some things straightened out. But then also maybe this interaction normally ends in jail. <laughs> you know, and um, and so I thought that was just something that kind of, um, I don't know, was just a good, clever way to try to drive that point home. And then it's this really cool song in Hamilton where Jefferson and uh, Hamilton, they go into this room and hammer out the deal of where the nation's capital is going to be and where the nation's banks are going to be. And that song is called The Room Where It Happens. And so I kind of put that in the area uh, where where those gentlemen there were kind of like in their own little unity room trying to you know iron some things out. So we're together at birth, we're together in our youth, we're together in our friendships, we're together in our violence, we're even together in our efforts to make peace. But one of our most intimate spaces where we go after the world has beat us up or, or, or we're tired from giving our all to our passions of the world, we are even together in our homes. Dina De La Cruz is a worker at Lark Incorporated and she helps disadvantaged or disabled adults find a way to live and function in their homes. And she goes into their homes and she helps them with their bills and, and she helps them organize stuff and she helps them get groceries and she helps them with their medicine to make sure that it's the proper doses and all that kind of stuff. So even in our most intimate places, we are fine being together. No problem. The things we buy at home goods <laughs> to decorate our home with sometimes are black and white. And even our, our welcome mats most of the time are black and white or it's like a cardinal bird with some cherries in his mouth or something when it's not that. But most times it's in black and white, thus the welcome home. I don't know, I thought that was kind of clever. And, and, and kind of cool. And then this 815135 is the numerical version of the word home. And I'm not sure why I put that there. The only thing that I could kind of figure out was maybe to show that, that, that black folks are, that there's some Bobby Fisher chess thinking going on here. You know, that, that it's not just, uh, you know, singing and dancing and, and playing basketball all the time that, you know, we've got some we're capable of deep thoughts, you know. I think that, I think that's what that means to me. I'm not sure, but now this just might have to be the most fun one that um, I think popped up. Let's say so. This young man is a football player at Naples High School, and this is his girlfriend, and they actually happen to win homecoming king and queen. Now, this brother right here is gonna hear it from the black girls for going out with the white girl. That's just the truth. We may not like it, but it's true. Now this white girl is gonna hear it not only from the black girls for going out with the black guy, but she's also gonna get it from the white guys. What I'm saying here is that they are gonna have to endure some things being said about them that is not very positive. Now, that's just the truth, we can't deny it. And so I think we need to protect 
Thus, what an umbrella does, we need to protect this effort and this type of courage to be with someone regardless of what they look like. And then I kind of want you to have to feel something in the back of your neck. I want you to have to look up to this behavior because there are a lot of people in their lives looking down on it. So <laughs> I think that was my thinking here. Now, once again, these are just my thoughts. You can, you can think what you want to think about all of these pieces so far, but I feel that this is a symbol of protection for us if we decide just to be ourselves. She's Megan and he's Carlin. That's it. That's it. Or, or am I saying they are the reigning homecoming king and queen? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> okay. All right. So I keep doing this review thing because I want to hammer this point home. Put together in our birth, our youth, our friendships, our violence, and our efforts to make peace in our home. And we're together even in our relationships, for sure. In our love, possibly, you might say. But this probably has to be one of the most simple, but yet the most telling representation of our inseparable union. So this is Coach Ron Hoover, legendary high school coach at North Fort Myers High School. And this is Deion Sanders. This was taken maybe in 2019. And they have been lifelong friends. As long as Deion has been living, Coach Hoover has been by his side. See, in my mind, you don't get this type of moment, this type of relationship that spans you know, 10, 20, 30 years if you don't put in the time. This has got nothing to do with his nickname being prime time. That's way too, that wasn't my idea. And to me, that's not what this is about. Ron Hoover had to give his time to help Dion get to where he wanted to be. But then Dion had to give his time to Ron Hoover as well, because Ron Hoover's passion was football. And you gotta have players to play football. So Dion gave his time. And in the latter parts of Ron Hoover's time, Dion is still there in his life. Even when Ron Hoover can't give him any type of football skills anymore. So we share our most precious thing we have, which is our time. Aaron's here right now giving us his time. That's just the truth. So I really, really like this. And then there's this song from Hamilton. I know you guys are saying you're killing me with these songs, but I just think it's kind of fun and cool where it says Washington on your side. It must be nice. It must be nice to have Washington on your side. Washington on the side of young Hamilton. I don't know. I just think it's pretty cool. All right. So. We are even inseparable in our art. When we create, we are inseparable. Not in the art that I created, but in this t-shirt that's worn by Greg Apsed, who's the leader of the Coalition for Farm Workers in Immokalee. Now, this picture is of Martin Luther King putting his hand over Donald Trump's mouth as Donald Trump tweets, right? And I captured this picture in this moment maybe two years ago. And if I just put that picture up there, just put it up there, I had it just up there, but I didn't know what I was trying to say when I put the picture up there. Uh, I just didn't know because these are just my thoughts now. We have to be careful when we start to try to silence people. We may not like what they say, but we need to be careful. 
So I found uh, a, a, a portion of our First Amendment, which is written in black and white, by the way. <laughs> you know, our most, the, the uh, one of our founding documents, all of our founding documents are written in black and white. But this is little small thing while we try to silence people. It's like that freedom of speech, all oh, that freedom of speech thing. So let's not forget about that, right? Because I have thoughts in my mind is black folks have been saying white folks have been trying to silence them for years. So now black folks are going to turn around and try to silence white folks. I think a crooked cop is a crooked cop, no matter what color he is. These are just my thoughts about it. I may not like what he says, but he's got the right to say that. So even in our art, we are inseparable. We're, we're touching one another. Every single picture that you've seen so far, every picture in the exhibit, black folks and white folks are touching one another. They're, they're, they're fine being close to one another. Now, the other thing is, this is not like my opinion. These are real life moments captured in Southwest Florida. They're documentary moments. I didn't go to that white nurse and say, go pick up that black baby because I want to take a picture of you. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. So I feel that I am proving my point that we are inseparable. I, I just think that that's clear for sure. Now, as we get to the later stages of our life, we still find ourselves together, even in the later stages of our life. We have Linda and she's caring for Florence in a local nursing home. And she's got this white rag and she's, you know, getting her ready to go to a Christmas party. And she just combed her hair. She just really cared for her. And I captured that moment. And I just like the way they're looking at one another. And, 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 and Florence trusts Linda, you know, in her most intimate space, you know. And so maybe this, this cloth that I picked out was to mimic this cloth. And maybe these black band-aids that I found at Target, believe it or not, mimic Linda, thus black, caring for Florence that's white, right? Maybe these band-aids symbolize a healing that can take place, you know, at this stage in life. Sometimes, whether it be Linda or Florence, they shed beliefs they had about one another sometimes in later stages of life. You know what I mean? Oh, I used to think that all black people were lazy but I don't think that anymore. Oh, I used to think that all white folks were trying to hold me down. Oh, I don't think that anymore. Is that what these band-aids symbolize? Or are they positioned in a way to speak to that it's the DNA of our lives to be together? Or am I saying that people in the black community think that they spend all of their lives and the years of their lives caring for white people or in service to white people. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what or how I feel about that. Those are just some thoughts that I had as I was making it. But one thing is crystal clear is that they are together. They are together. And so our union begins in birth. It continues in our youth. It continues in our friendships, in our violence, in our efforts to make peace, in our homes, in our love, in our time, in our art, in the last years of our life. And if, 
if all of those shared life's moments don't make it clear that we are inseparable and that we are fine with the black and white aesthetic, in our heaviest moment, and I didn't even think about the heaviness of it until Aaron and I were arranging this particular one. This is a headstone and it's heavy and it's cold and it's final. It's, it's over with, it's over. There's no going back once we reach this stage in our life. And we are at our most vulnerable here when our loved ones go. We are hurting. And no matter how heavy or cold or how much we want to isolate ourselves away from the rest of the world when we lose someone we care about, guess what happens? We find Black people and white people together even in that moment. Julian King, the Florida and Fish Wildlife Officer was shot and killed in LaBelle in 2020. He had a smile as bright as not only our son, but every son in the universe. And the folks in LaBelle painted a mural of this black man on the side of a wall. They're gonna make a statue for him. Now, in case you don't know, LaBelle is not predominantly uh, black now, in, in case you forgot. But he was raised in part by a white family. And those families got together in that heavy moment, in that cold moment, and they wept together and they tried to heal one another together. They were intimately inseparable in this moment. It, 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 it's, it's, it's so clear that black people and white people, we're only talking that narrow for this exhibit because that's the conflict that we can't seem to get our, our mind around. It's the, one, it's the one Rubik's cube that we just can't seem to figure out. And I'm saying maybe we need to stop trying to figure it out and just play with the damn Rubik's Cube. I don't know, but we're together. But not only that, the symbols that we use to honor our most beloved soldiers, our POWs and MIAs specifically created for our Vietnam veterans, but it applies to all of our POWs and MIAs. That flag that flies in Washington that the Proud Boys carry during the insurrection at the Capitol is in black and white. Oh, Ken Fay, you're making everything so shallow. Wait a minute, what are you talking about? That's all we argue about is color. And what I'm trying to prove is that we're fine with it. And I've proven that throughout our lives, we are okay with it. So let's get cheesy. Oh, I love this one. This is the Brady Bunch cheesy one. This is the Wayne Brady, let's just all get along one. So we have this, <laughs> I can't believe I said that. <laughs> we have this globe you know, surrounded by all of this dirt. And then we have this one-way sign that the city gave me. I did not have to take it from a back road anywhere. And then we have this nice moment from a protest where a black girl and a white girl, you know, are together. So am I trying to say that there's only one way to stop this from happening is to join together? I think so. I think that's what I'm trying to say here. But as me and Aaron were trying to figure out exactly uh, how we were gonna mount this picture, because 
I don't have this great, oh, this is my artistic vision and only I can contribute to it, you know? Uh, we kind of thought that, you know, using this putty on the corners is kind of symbolic in a lot of ways. You know, life is not polished. It's never gonna be that way. It's a work in progress. You gotta use some scotch tape sometime. You know, you gotta hold things together with what you got. And I don't know, I, I think that, that that's fitting. I don't know, I probably have said some things that, that people may not, you know, that may have overcooked some folks' grits and, and that's just not my, uh, that's not my intention. And I, yes, I am talking with passion and it's not very nice and, and quiet talk because I just think that it's so clear that we are inseparable. It's so clear that we are fine with it. And just to annoy you and annoy me, I used all these black and white objects to show that we are aesthetically fine. So that's it, really. I know Aaron's never gonna ever invite me to do another interview, but <laughs> that's it. Those were my thoughts. I encourage you guys, please come down here if you can and um, spend some time with each piece and then you're gonna get your own thoughts because your quiet time with each piece is gonna unravel something that I didn't think about. And um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's pretty cool. I know I said that a thousand times, but <laughs> I think it's fine. Yeah, here, let me flip the camera around here. Sure. And we'll see if, uh, if anybody has any questions at all uh, that's joining us tonight, any comments or anything, um, feel free to, uh, Unmic yourself and let me make another little adjustment here. Hang tight. Very sophisticated. Well, I just got to say that was beautiful. I, I've heard that um, explanation and walk through several times and being part of it and uh, it never gets old. It's always just as beautiful as the first time. So thank you again. Uh, let me jump back here and I'll check. Um, if anybody has anything would like to add, uh, feel free uh, un unmute yourself there and just uh, jump on in. We can have a little discussion. Uh, if you have any uh, comments or things you'd like to say, uh, please go ahead, don't hesitate. I'll be right Hi. back. Okay, should I go now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Anita. Thank you so much um, for this really great um, discussion. I can't wait to get down there and see everything myself. I'm really enjoying everything that you're having to say. Um, looking at the images, I also follow you on Instagram, so I've seen a lot of your, um, your imaging um, throughout time. One of the things I noticed is how close you are able to really get to your subjects. You know, as you look in here, you're, you're almost part of the scene, but you're also maybe to a certain extent, do you try to stay invisible? Do you make yourself part of what you're taking a photo of? Are you interacting with your subjects a lot or does it vary? Well, first of all, thank you, Anita. And I wish I was in Paris because it seems like you're sitting in Paris right now. Okay. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about that, about capturing moments. Uh, one thing is, if I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there, right? If I go to Paris, I'm going to every little bookstore I can find, and I'm going to the Eiffel Tower, and I'm going to try to ride every gondola I can, right? I'm, I'm going to be there. So what I mean by that is I'm going to put my fear aside, and I'm going to open up my heart, thus being there and being open to what's going on. Here's another way to look at it. Disney World works for adults when they suspend their disbelief. Am I right? So whatever, wherever I go to document a moment, I just make sure that I immerse myself into that 50th wedding anniversary and it's my 50th wedding anniversary. The third thing is this. I don't touch the scene I never ask someone to do something again. I just stay so 
engaged with that scene that I don't allow myself to miss a moment. Here's why. If someone invites me to document their life, the Keene family said, Ken Fay, come out. You can come to our funeral. I owe it to them to cut my vein and give everything I have to capture in that moment. That does not mean go to that funeral and lollygag around. It, it just doesn't mean that. You know, it means to intimately open yourself up to what is happening. So I think to recap is if I'm gonna be there, I'm gonna be there. Secondly, I do try to get as close physically as I can because I don't know. Uh, I just think that's the way life is lived, uh, in clo up, up close. And um, I just try to stay engaged in the moment as much as I can. You know, I, I, I have this idea that if I like you, I, I get real close in my wide angle lens. And if I don't like you, I get way back with my... <laughs> yeah, so hopefully that answered your question. It does. If I can follow up with one small question, which is, do you ever feel unsafe or in situations where you feel like, I wish I wasn't invading this moment or anything like that? No, because I cut my vein. If I go to a funeral, if I go to cover the Iraq war, when these people see me, my body language would tell them that I'm all in, you know, and that I'm not there just to sensationalize something, you know. If I capture a horrific war moment, I captured a horrific war moment of a mother and daughter on gurneys in a hospital in Basra. And the picture ran all over the, uh, the country. But then I followed that mother and daughter for a week, you know, and didn't capture any moments of them. I just followed them, you know what I mean? And, and, and made sure they were okay. So uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's the most true answer I can give you, I guess. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I'll wait for the ticket to Paris. You and me both. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Now it's that awkward part, part where I'm still here and you're still here and we're waiting to see if someone else jumps on. Yeah, go ahead, Stacy. I'll go. Okay. Hi, Ken Fay. I'm Stacy Brown. Hey, do you know Susie? I do know Susie. She's been trying to get you and I to, to, to meet. Just overlook her. I don't know what she's, we dance at Publix together and uh, she's an old friend. Okay. <laughs> well, here we are together at last. I'll let her know. Um, you know, I just have to say that I'm gonna steal something that you said. Um, I may have overcooked someone's grits. So <laughs> I'm, I'm from Alabama and so that really resonates for me and I, I regularly overcook people's grits. And so um, I, I like that very much. Um, so I've been, I've admired your photography for a long time and I'm an amateur photography person myself. And so that, that, um, your, your work is, is really interesting for me, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to know why, <laughs> why did you decide, or how did you come to the conclusion to hang the lyrics and to hang the papers rather than just sticking them on the wall? Well, I think, uh, some thoughts about that would be who wants to be stuck to a wall, first of all. <laughs> You know, uh, um, I don't like frames for pictures at all. Okay. And I think that life has an ebb and flow to it. Life moves in and out. And so maybe symbolically, uh, I, I thought that that was important to, to allow the music of life. Man, that really sounds really abstract, right? Allow the music of life to like move in and out. But also there's an aesthetic, um, I think, um, idea to that. It creates some depth 
in the overall exhibit, you know, mm -hmm. and um, as, as, as much as, you know, I would like to say, oh, this is my vision and, and, and I don't have to worry about you staying engaged with it. You should automatically want to spend a minute in front of each piece. Uh, that's not the way the world works, you know. I think hanging the music was a way to maybe keep people engaged with the pieces longer as well. So it's a very practical, I think, way, a, a very practical reason for hanging it besides the abstract uh, reasons of, uh, you know, of moving through life, I think. Well, a couple of things come to my mind too. You know, music is often referred to as a movement, right? So if, if it's hanging, then there's probably some movement, right? I which I, I, that's what the first thing, but just as you were talking, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a mental health therapist. And so I deal a lot with shadow work, which is the darker sides of our personality. And I can't help but notice that there's shadows that, that are cast. So that adds another element to the black and the white of your exhibit. See, the great thing about that is that never entered my mind when I'm creating this. And the great thing about having like a collaboration, mm. I'm a different kind of, I don't like the artist thing. I think that's very, um, it's got a lot of negative connotations to it. I created these pieces. I have a strong idea of what I want the story to say. But when I brought these pieces here, Aaron and I, Aaron and I together figured out uh, uh, you know, a way to lay this out. You have to honor the creativity mm -hmm. of others when you create. I just can't give this to Aaron and say, get out of here, let me go do it the way I want. Then I'm dishonoring Aaron's creativity. I'm dishonoring his willingness to cut his vein creatively and, and, and give it all to me. You see what I mean? It has to an experience. It, it, it's not enough to put a picture on a wall and say, you figure it out. Me and Aaron needed to figure out a way to set this up where there's an experience. Now, Aaron caught that shadow thing. I did. I, I'm, I'm a little bit too shallow for that. See? Aaron and I are a lot alike in that way. Okay. But <laughs> as I that's lovely. Yeah, it's, okay. it's nice. It, it's wonderful lines. And it, 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 the co-creation process was, was a, obviously a good plan. So well yeah. done. And I could have used you doing mentally during this uh, creation of this. That's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I've also followed your work, not on Instagram, but I'm of the generation of Facebook and, um, and the news press. I've loved your images and what you capture. And I heard the um, podcast of these stories and it was so moving. It was just so moving to me. So when I saw that this was happening, um, Drew and I moved from Fort Myers. We lived there 40 years and we moved four years ago. We're on the East Coast, Euro Beach, and I can't come and experience the exhibit. So I was thrilled to see this opportunity. I, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Um, you're, you um, made it not just a visual experience, but a somatic experience. I love hearing you express it. Yeah. So, yeah. A bit thanks. over the time. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe like you and Drew, when you are unpacking the passions of your life, you give in to the, you know, the Frank Lloyd Wright fiery expressions, you know what I mean? And so uh, I think, um, I think that, like, that's one way you can tell if I'm full of BS or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm willing to give everything. And thank you for like tuning in from Vero Beach for sure. You're welcome. I'd love to have you over here if you're traveling with that exhibit. <laughs> you know what? It, it, uh, I'm probably going to pack it up on January 29th. So uh, you can reach out to me. I'll work on that. <laughs> and, I'll work on that. <laughs> uh, Jared there. Because uh, 
you know, um, the union travels for sure. You know, we're in for everywhere, not just in Fort Myers. So yeah, most definitely. And I'll bring it down and, and um, put it up and then that'd be great. Well, welcome right. to you guys coming on. Thank you. All right, take care. <laughs> well, I just wanna say thank you again, Kim Fei. Um, Again, it, you know, that was a big part. Thanks for your comment, Debbie. That, that was a big part why we wanted to um, document this uh, experience and, and be able to share it for uh, others in the future and, and to really just see how you know, seeing you in front of the work and, and seeing you talk about it uh, really lights it up in a whole nother um, view. And, and again, it was a pleasure and an honor uh, to work with you on this. And, and um, you know, I think we, we left a lot open-ended for people to find their own meanings there. Uh, so that sort of, I think it did benefit. It was nice to hear Stacy's comment too, of seeing some of the things that were subconsciously going on. So <laughs> again, I'll just uh, thank you all for, for being here. And um, we'll post this on YouTube here once we get it cleaned up a little bit and uh, you can share it with friends and things like that as well. So um, take care everybody and, and uh, we will see you soon again. Oh yeah, Kim Fei, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just have to say a special uh, acknowledgement to my friend Tamara Joy Hunter from Franklin Park Elementary. You guys haven't seen her, but in support of me running my mouth for the last hour, she's come out here and has been quietly behind the scenes. So I wanna say uh, thank you to uh, soon to be Principal Hunter for sure. And uh, thank you to the community for tuning in. Thank you. They're all applauding. <laughs> the silent applause. All right, everybody. Well, good night. We're all good? <laughs>